Hi everyone. Um, so um, today I will try to provide you an overview uh, with respect to all the literature or <laughs> what I've read about uh, and the main findings of uh, on how biological system um, process numerical information. And also I will try to highlight what are also some of the main critical points also from my point of view. And I would be happy to receive any feedback about them. And so um, just for a little outline, uh, I will start um, reasoning on why this is important, uh, speak about behavioral evidence, what is uh, the approximate number system, and uh, something around this debate on if we are speaking about numbers, numerosity or quantities, uh, something about the neurobiological evidence and then uh, some final comments. So uh, just to start, we know that physics uh, produce models and theories that describe phenomena and the fundamental properties of physical reality. Uh, but what neuroscience does or try to do is to produce models and theories of how this external uh, physical world and our brain interact. So with respect to, for example, space, time, and number, we usually associate them to our theories and symbolic knowledge, but they are really um, the real domains and structure of the experience of any biological organism. Um, so it's hard to imagine, for example, how any animal um, could survive without processing, um, processing mechanism for uh, spatial navigation temporal orienting um, and elementary numerical or quantical computation. So for example, choosing um, the food patch with the largest uh, expected reward. Um, so when we study our brain and we want, um, often we want to, um, so we aim at understanding uh, how our brain shape and elaborate information. And often, uh, mostly there is this desire of explaining our cognitive abilities such as uh, language, uh, mathematical ability, consciousness. But we have to remember always that we, when we study our brain, we are part of, uh, um, our brain belongs to an evolutive history and we are species among others. And so a lot of our cognitive abilities are shared also with other animals, uh, as well as the underlying neural processes. So often this type of questions regards also other animals. And with respect to the specific issue um, of this talk, so assessing the discrete uh, quantity um, is indeed of extreme importance in several ecological niches. So um, just some example, uh, faded minnows, which are a specific uh, species of fish, uh, choose to associate with the larger shoal of two shoals to get a greater pr um, protection from predators. Or again, um, for example, chickadees vary their mobbing calls, so uh, the number of syllables for call, um, in response to a variation of the predator uh, body size. And so the fact that these abilities spread uh, throughout the animal kingdom uh, for species with a very um, different evolutive history and uh, um, make us ask why it's so diffused is diffused because it's at the base indeed with our interaction uh, with the world. And so all this evidence, both from experimental and field work, brought to the hypothesis of a common mechanism, uh, which is the approximate number system, which should be involved in, in pre-symbolic and pre-verbal um, quantity estimation, uh, uh, both in simultaneous and sequential numerical tasks across sensory modalities. And it has been also called number sense due to the fact that indeed it's something that relates to our perception and uh, more sensory uh, interaction <laughs> with, the, with the physical quantities. Um, and it responds to Weber law, which is a psychophysical law, as Sylvester explained before in more details, so I will not uh, go too much in details now, but is the phys psychophysical rule which formalizes the relationship that exists between a magnitude of physical uh, stimuli and the power of discriminating them. So uh, the just noticeable difference is directly proportional to the absolute um, physical magnitude. And 
this lead to the fact that the ability to differentiate two quantities is a function of their ratio instead of their absolute value. And so just an example, uh, two cycles of this of this law are the distance effect. So the fact that there is a, a greater discriminability for two uh, distant numbers rather than two close ones. And so it will be easier to discriminate that the, the set on the right is bigger than the one on the left in the case of the second uh, image, so the second pair. And also the size effect, which instead refers to the fact that there is a reduced accuracy in differentiating uh, at a given distance two large numbers instead of two smaller ones. So in the second case, it's more difficult to assess which is bigger, even if uh, both pairs stayed at the same uh, distance. So um, the problem is that when we speak uh, of approximate number system, there is this confusion about the use of these terms. So numbers, quantities, we are speaking about numerosity, numerousness, um, and also if numbers, which kind of numbers do really this biological system represents. And for example, there is one scientist that, is, that works in this field, which is called Gallistel, which call numbers any measurable quantity, so any magnitude, uh, while with numerosity refers to uh, discrete quantity. And for those who have followed the talk of the last week by Nunez, he, for example, referred to numbers only uh, with, um, for uh, what we intend for symbolic quantifiers that designates uh, the cardinality uh, of, a, of a collection of, of objects. So it's not clear in which sense, um, if we are really speaking of numbers or, or, or numerosity, these terms that is not even a kind of a word, it's an invented word. So in particular, the problem and the debate regards the fact that if we are really representing uh, numbers of continuous quantities, that, so there is this um, famous uh, paper, I would say, in the field, um, which uh, from Leibovitch and colleagues, which state that it, it's nearly impossible to study non-symbolic numerosity processing in isolation from continuous magnitudes. So this is the, due to the fact that if you have two, uh, let's say, two sets, you can control some continuous uh, variables. So, for example, the area of them, and try to uh, isolate in this case the different numerosity. But there will be always another. Um, continuous magnitudes that you will not be able to control because you, you cannot control all of them at the same time. So the perimeter, for example, will, will be not controlled. And also there are like units, the, those that claim that numerical cognition involves exact and symbolic representation and that approximate number system deals only with quantities. And, and then again, the fact that instead of a numerosity system, there is a sensory integration system um, which therefore is not independent from the sensory cues. Um, but uh, what I, uh, I don't know, I, um, I think about this debate and I will, I will be happy to discuss uh, with you, what do you think about is that if numbers can be considered um, as abstract objects, uh, which denotes physical objects, so which can have different instantiation, uh, like uh, different spatial distribution of luminance that are perceived by their optic array or different types of temporal distribution of acoustic waves, then there is not uh, really this opposition between uh, number and physical quantities because they are just in a relationship at uh, different levels. So numbers would have like a second order character that uh, non-numerical quantities, quantities lack, but uh, to pose the two hypotheses regarding if we are speaking of numbers or if we are speaking of uh, only uh, physical quantities is uh, just, there is not an opposition between these two, I think. Um, so um, coming to the neurobiological evidence, um, the issue is how this information is processed and where in the brain and in which brains which are very different from each other. And while much has been said about uh, the behavioral proof 
of this numerical capacity. Uh, the literature about the neural correlates, it's uh, still in its infancy in the sense that there is a, there, it, it's growed uh, very slowly with respect to the early studies, which were in the 1970s, and little attention has been devoted to comparative aspects of number representations. So mostly um, primates and humans have been studied and crowds in, in some cases. Um, and also more, uh, there was much more focus on associative region of the pallium uh, due to this idea that number is an abstract property and so requires uh, higher uh, cognitive abilities. So a lot of evidence points toward the involvement of the posterior parietal cortex in numerical estimation tasks, uh, both in adults and children of uh, homo sapiens, but also in macaques. And, uh, for example, in tasks involving assessing which uh, of two sets has more elements, for example. Uh, so the parietal, posterior parietal cortex in mammals is an integration hub where visual and auditory information is uh, combined with the somatosensory one. And it involves the dorsal visual stream um, and the cortex around the intraparietal sulcus. So this uh, Area, the intraparietal sulcus, is involved in merging sensory information, but has also important outputs which are sent um, to motor and premotor areas. And in particular, in uh, two subregions of this intraparietal sulcus, there have been found some neurons that um, were selective uh, for numerosity. So uh, there was this uh, lateral intraparietal area where there were these neurons um, that respond monotonically to numbers in the sense that they increased uh, their firing rate with increasing uh, numerosity, as you can see here on, on this graph. And uh, this has been called some machine coding. And these monkeys were not trained, so they adjust to pay attention to the screen, as you can see here. Um, while on the other side, different kinds of neurons have been found in another area, so the uh, ventral intraparietal area. And this time, um, macaques uh, had to perform a match to samples task, so choose which of, of two stimuli matched in the number uh, of the one showed before. And uh, they showed us a number code in the sense that the selectivity. Um, uh, each neuron was selective for a preferred numerosity in the sense that its, um, its neural response reached its peak for its preferred numerosity. While addition to numerosity, as you can see here for the neurons preferring three, for example, um, elicit weaker response currently with the distance from the preferred one. And these were, called, were, were what they were called um, number neurons and they were found also in the prefrontal cortex, um, which is known as a fundamental hub for higher level and flexible cognitive control, and uh, on, differently from the one in the uh, parietal cortex, these, um, while presented with numerosity in different modalities, so uh, auditory, for example, and visually, the same group of neurons responded to the same um, numerosity in the prefrontal cortex, while different group of neurons responded to the same numerosity uh, in the two modalities in the parietal cortex. Um, and these similar neurons have been found also in the crow and brain, uh, which is uh, so in, a dors in the dorsal portion of the telencephalon in an area called the nido pallio caudo laterale, which is um, considered to be functionally similar to the prefrontal cortex in, uh, in birds. And uh, these neurons had the same tuning properties. They responded, uh, they were responded both to simultaneous or sequential stimuli. And also in the case of zebrafish, there were um, studies that show the uh, presence of some neurons responding to a numerical property of stimuli in the dorsal central division of um, the caudal telencephalon. But um, however, coming to the primary idea of the number sense, which is characterized by these sensory psychophysical rules, it should make uh, 
more sense to investigate the primary sensory system involved in this case in these type of tasks so uh, probably or at least um, a possible uh, hypothesis is that since uh, number numerical cognition is regarded as a, an advanced cognitive skills in the sense that it is associated with, with math. Um, this has brought to the fact that more attention has been devoted to associative region and more um, a species that are more similar to us. Uh, however, numerical perception responds to Weber law, as we said before, and respond also to sensory adaptation, uh, similarly to um, uh, to other primary sensory properties such as size or color, and also animals without pallial homologs, such as uh, insects or are even artificial neural networks, are able to of this type of um, to perform this type of task. So, in particular, for example, the tectum is a midbrain structure shared among their to braids, which is involved in um, sensory motor functions and is a, a crucial relay uh, of uh, visual and uh, auditory systems. So the tectum receives direct in sensory input and um, it's reciprocally connected with the forebrain and the spinal cord. And the optic part of this tectum uh, is involved into uh, competitive visual stimulus uh, selection. So it controls rapid orienting behaviors. Um, and mm, it has been found that uh, the optic tectum of zebrafish, for example, encodes and classifies object size. So different population of neurons um, were tuned to small or large uh, objects. Uh, depending to the, um, and these receptive fields were shaped through direct afferents uh, input from the retinal ganglion cell. So basically, uh, depending on uh, the, um, the dendritic field of retinal ganglion cells, if it was wide or narrow, it activated different population of neurons in the tectum that then elicited different type of behavior through connection with promoter neurons. And similar, um, Mm, selective mm, properties in this area were found um, in a neurons and pigeons, but also in humans. And also the thalamus is another uh, area region that receive uh, primary uh, sensory information from different sensory modalities and send to multiple uh, cortical fields. So, um, and uh, there are some thalamic nuclei that act also as motor uh, relays connecting basal ganglia and motor cortices. And in particular, there is the lateral geniculate nucleus, which is the uh, visual thalamic nucleus that, similarly to the optic tectum, receives direct input from uh, retinal ganglion cells. And and uh, since as the tectum is conserved among vertebrates, um, and its superficial layers are topographically organized and project to uh, the primary visual areas in the pallium. So there are evidence of the, its involvement both in humans and in zebrafish in cases of um, task involving numerosity. And also this area has been shown to respond to the Weber law in, uh, in cats. So there are neurons uh, in the lateral geniculate nucleus that respond to different light intensities uh, obeying to the vapor law. And um, also, uh, we know that very small brains in the uh, order of um, um, one million neurons uh, can discriminate numerosity among uh, So it seems plausible that small circuits or or restrained computational resources are sufficient to accomplish this type of quantity computation. And so, um, although there is no neurobiological information um, about uh, where in the brain of uh, in insects, and in particular of bees that are the animal model most studies, most studied, um, the insect model most studied in this uh, numerical task, uh, we know that, for example, bees employ a sequential scan visual scanning, so 
uh, they uh, process stimuli in a sequential order through active uh, visual motor exploration. And um, this is proved by the fact that they, um, they fail in simple tasks when, for example, stimulus presentation is limited in time. And uh, this is in line with uh, um, the fact that they possess a small visual acuity, uh, which limit basically um, a visual scene, and uh, but at the same time um, they they have uh, photoreceptors with the fastest uh, faster um, temporal response, or also the fastest, I think, um, that are very functional to this type of active vision pattern. So the photoreceptor uh, uh, photoreceptor architecture, in, in a certain way, constrains the behavior of exploration of this type of stimuli, and so we can think uh, of possible. Um, Mm, mm, uh, hires of these little brains that are involved. So, for example, already uh, in the first areas, um, so like, like the lobula, the first sensory pathways, uh, we know of um, the presence of segregated pathways for color and motion. So, um, this great quantity would be already involved in. in Coded in these first steps, or otherwise, there is an area called the central complex, which is the center of sensory integration and uh, mostly visual, and as also important, and, um, is also important important for uh, motor control. And again, I will not go deeper into neural networks because Sylvester already explored them, but um, different type of uh, neural networks. Uh, show it to be able to simulate human and non-human animal behaviors, but uh, as we said uh, also before, um, they cannot be considered in a certain way true simulation of realistic bi biological processes. And so in a certain, in a epistemological way, they are, they have great explorative power, but, uh, and they can demonstrate the feasibility of a particular approach, for example, a, uh, to a problem, and also for the fact that we can model things from inside, but most of these networks are not biologically uh, realistic. While there is, I think, this one um, very abstract model of only for neural neuro, uh, units that was inspired by the work done in bees, um, with which were able to uh, basically was able to match the bees performance um, and uh, in a, in uh, in uh, numerical ordering tasks. So um, basically, it was provided with visual input that was reconstructed by um, uh, bees path bees path in uh, uh, this type of tasks and uh, from their physiological constraints. And it was shown to be able. I will not go too much in details, but it was shown to be able to. Mm, uh, reproduce and predict the the landing of bees, for example, and the decision make uh, from them. So, just uh, on the wake of this minimalist approach, um, maybe to think about very big brains and complex, high functional associative regions is not necessary because, um, yeah, scarce uh, computational resource and uh, small brains can accomplish this type of. Uh, discrimination. And uh, just uh, last slide. Um, this is, um, these are some um, pictures taken from a book called Vehicles from Valentino Breitenberg, with, in which um, this scientist that was also the director of the Max Planck Institute of Biological Cybernetics, um, he may basically make these imaginative talks experiments in which he show how easy it is to uh, ascribe mental states. And so uh, he invented uh, vehicles in which, in which are agents that can uh, autonomously move, uh, basically having just primitive sensors that measure some stimulus and wheels um, 
that function basically as effectors. And so uh, depending on the configuration, um, a sensor is directly connected to the, an effector. And depending on how they are connected, uh, the vehicles can exhibit uh, different behaviors that can be considered, for example, in, in the case of this image, um, the two vehicles would both dislike one sources, but while one could be considered a coward, so escape from the source, the other would have um, would have an aggressive behavior because we would attack the source. And uh, with respect to numbers, it shows how introducing uh, some threshold devices into this simple um, networks uh, in. Mm, basically mm, um, can uh, enable the device to count in the sense that a network like this um, uh, emits a pulse on for every third pulse in a row in the input. So would, would for example, move only uh, after um, mm, seeing three, uh, three mm, stimuli. And uh, we would say in this case that maybe this device is counting, but what, what is there is just um, a threshold and uh, that enable to, the vehicle to operate in this way. And so these are just a little uh, quote from the book where it says that um, it's actually impossible theory to determine exactly what the hidden mechanism is without be, uh, opening the box, since there are always many different mechanisms with identical behavior. And so uh, the analysis is much more difficult than invention in the sense that induction takes more time to perform than uh, deduction. Um, so in induction, one has to search for the way, whereas in deduction, one follows a straightforward path. And uh, a consequence of this is the fact that we tend to overestimate the complexity when we analyze a mechanism. Uh, and I think this can, in a certain way, apply also to, uh, to this case. And just this is just to conclude. So maybe we don't need these complex processes in order to accomplish this kind of estimation. And maybe looking also more into our sensory system instead of more uh, higher functional um, areas that are also less known uh, would be better. And maybe also future studies can fo should focus on characterizing better this mechanism uh, and not only assessing the disability. Um, and then there is this big question <laughs> continues to come to mind. So that is it number or quantity or if any measurable quantity is an instance of a number. So there, these two, there is no opposition between them and that's all.